Jeremiah chapter 21, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, when King Zedekiah sent unto Pasture, the son of, son of Melchiah, Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Masiah, whatever that guy's name is, he's got more vowels, he's got consonants, Masiah, the priest, saying, Inquire, I pray thee, of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, maketh war against us, if so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works, that he may go up from us. Uh, then said Jeremiah unto them, Thus shall ye say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls. I will assemble them into the midst of this city, and I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand uh, and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good singing. We thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you, Lord, we can assemble in the house of God. Lord, what a blessing, what a privilege to be able to have uh, uh, these liberties afforded to us one more time. God, we don't want to take for granted your blessings and your privileges, but we are grateful and thankful. Lord, we do come to you tonight asking you to bless the, those that are working with young people on the other side of the building. Lord, we're thankful for our young people. We're thankful for those that, Lord, give up their Sunday night service to work with them. We're glad for the truth that's being poured into them. We're glad for the fruit we've seen out of our young people. We're glad for those that have trusted in Christ. And God, I pray for any of those that have reached the age of accountability and haven't trusted in Christ, uh, that tonight would be the night that they trust in Him as Lord and Savior. Thank you for those that are working with the teens, and thank you for those that, Lord, are just uh, faithful to come to the house of God and sing praise unto you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, Father, I pray you'd help us over the next few minutes. Uh, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel, and I pray that the Word of God would come alive to us. Uh, may it be received with gladness, uh, and God, may Jesus be highly exalted. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd edify the saints of God. Uh, God, I pray for Holy Ghost conviction, uh, and then, God, I do pray uh, for Holy Ghost comfort. Uh, God, have your will and way. Touch lives, touch hearts. Uh, Save that one nearest hell, uh, and again glorify your name's sake. And Father, we'll bow these unworthy heads again, uh, and thank you for everything you've done. Uh, bless now, Father, we'll bless you for it. Uh, for it's in the holy name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen. Uh, amen. I want you to uh, uh, t just look for a few minutes as we look at this text uh, as a way of introduction. And first we see the probe. Uh, we find uh, in verse number 2 uh, uh, that Zedekiah, the king of Israel, uh, uh, seeks out the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, and he asked him to go and inquire of the Lord uh, uh, to see if the Lord's going to be good to him, and if the Lord's going to give him uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, uh, give him a victory in battle. Uh, it amazes me. Uh, Jeremiah's been preaching to him for some 20 years. Uh, uh, repent or the judgment of God's going to come. Uh, uh, we find even in chapter 20 uh, that past year uh, has Jeremiah thrown into prison uh, uh, we find that uh, they've ignored the man of God they've ignored the preaching from all the prophets uh, and uh, uh, here when trouble comes then they want to run and get God on the scene and God to help deliver them uh, uh, friend I'm afraid that's what's going to happen in America uh, one day some of these politicians going to wake up uh, and realize what a mess we're in uh, and those that said that the church was not essential, uh, they're going to be calling and begging somebody to get a hold of God, uh, but it's going to be too late, my dear friends. Uh, we see the probe. Uh, look at the pronouncement from the man of God. You all think I'm a rough preacher? Look at verse number 5. This is what God tells His chosen people. He says, And I myself, the Lord, will fight against you with an outstretched hand uh, and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. Now listen, it's one thing for somebody to be mad at you, but when God's mad at you, you're in trouble. 
Look what he said in verse 6. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. Uh, they shall die of great pestilence. Uh, and afterwards, saith the Lord, uh, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, and such are left in this city uh, from the pestilence and from the sword and from the famine uh, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, and into the hand of their enemies, uh, and into the hand of those that seek their life, and he shall smite them with the edge of the sword uh, he shall not spare them neither have pity nor have mercy ouch hmm? I wonder if Joe Osteen ever preaches on this text I mean I don't see something good happening on Friday on this day uh, that's what he says every day is a Friday something good is going to happen to you huh what can I say God said not only am I not going to deliver you not only am I not going to fight for you, I'm going to fight against you, and you, wicked king of Judah, I'm going to let them smite you with the edge of the sword. He said they'll not have pity. They'll not have mercy. We see the pronouncement. We see the probe. Now notice the paths. Look in verse number 8. To this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord. And again, any time the Lord says something, we better pay attention. Well, they weren't paying attention, but look what the Lord says. Behold, I will set before you the way of life and the way of death. He says there's two paths you can go. You can go the way of life or the way of death. Look at verse 9. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live and his life shall be unto him for a prey. He said you got two choices. You can stay in this city, and you're going to die either of hunger, you're going to die of disease, or they're going to break through and they're going to kill you with a sword. Or you can go out to the Chaldeans, and you can fall into their hands, and you're going to be a slave, but you'll live. Hmm? Can I say every time we come to the house of God, it's life or death? Can I say every choice that we make either is a choice for life, or it's a choice for death? Either those choices... Uh, will bring spiritual life and blessing into our life or we'll die a little bit spiritually. But can I say, all of our choices have consequences. We see the paths. Now notice the point, the reason why God has said all this to them. Look at verse 11. And touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David... Thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like a fire and burn that none can quench it because of, your, of, of the evil of your doings. Can I say you cannot sin and win? Can I say it's one thing for a wretched sinner that's never heard the word of God to act like a heathen? But can I say, those that have known the grace of God, those that have got the word of God, those that know the will of God, who ignore the will of God and live the life that they want to live and not live the life that God chooses for them to live, there are consequences. The Lord says that he will punish them because of the evil of their doings. Now can I say, we are given the word of God because without the word of God we didn't know what sin was. The law was given as our schoolmaster. But can I say, uh, for us to know to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. And it's one thing for somebody that's never been taught, but for us that have the word of God, we better, we better, we better reckon to the voice of the Lord. Why? Because God's keeping a record. Hmm? We don't think he's paying attention. We got this mindset, he's some old, old guy sitting in a rocking chair just... Uh, uh, dribbling oatmeal down his chin. No, that's Joe Biden. That's not God. God's in complete control. He's sovereign. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, uh, and He does keep a record, and one day the books will be open, and all of our lives will be on display. We'll give an account. So we find the point, the reason why God was going to be so stern with them. But notice, if you will, the punishment. Look at verse 13. He said, Behold, I am against thee, 
Hmm? Can anything be more horrid than knowing God's against you? Hmm? Hmm? Mercy. He said, Behold, I'm against thee, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, Who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter into our habitations? There are a lot of people think they've got things hid from God. They think they're insulated from God. They think that uh, they're exempt from the judgment of God. Uh, nobody's getting away with anything. Look what he says in verse 14. But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings. There's a payday someday, friend. Look what he says. I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, saith the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. I'm going to preach for just a few minutes tonight on when God's had enough. You see, we can look at the, the book of Jeremiah and look how Jeremiah deals with the nation of Israel, and we can see what happens when they've ignored what God has set before them. God uh, uh, oftentimes raised up prophets who preached unto them and told them uh, what thus saith the Lord, and they ignored the prophets, they stoned the prophets, uh, uh, they killed the prophets, uh, they did everything they could to live uh, whatever life they wanted to and thought that there was no price for that. Uh, and friends, we can equate that to America. Uh, America was founded on the principles and oracles of the Word of God. Uh, if you go study our forefathers, uh, they might not have all been saved but they had a conscience toward a holy God uh, and they were concerned uh, uh, that God's uh, people would be allowed to worship in this nation uh, and that everything that was set up in our constitution our laws and our government uh, was set up uh, with the design that almighty God would bless this nation uh, and friend he has blessed this nation uh, hey I don't agree with uh, most of what's going on in our country but I'm still for America I love America I think Thank God for America. She's still the greatest nation uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, but hey, God's not pleased with what's going on in America. We could look at this passage in context and look at the nation. But we can also look at it in context with the believer, with individual churches, huh? with an individual movement like the Independent Baptist Movement. Look out at, at, at it however you want to. But the title still applies. There comes a point when God's had enough. He looks around and he's not pleased. Huh? Can I say this? And I do not mean to be unkind, but hey, that's my nature. huh? But can I say this? Uh, 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 if the church would have been what the church should have been, uh, even through the Great Depression, uh, we wouldn't have the welfare system we've got in America. We wouldn't have all the give me programs in America. Hey, America would be more of a spiritual nation, more of a godly nation. Uh, uh, but hey, uh, uh, just like today, uh, uh, when problems come, uh, instead of looking to Almighty God and getting on our faces before God and asking God uh, what it's going to require to have his hand on us again. Uh, uh, we'll look to the right and look to the left. Uh, we'll trust in our own intellect, our own wisdom. Uh, hey, uh, what's going on in Washington we deserve because we have trusted in everything but God. Uh, mm, the church quit being what the church was supposed to be a long time ago. Can I say preachers quit being what preachers are supposed to be? Huh? Can I say a lot of uh, uh, instances today, there's not pastors, there's hirelings. There are fellows that have a job, not a calling. Hmm? Uh, can I say that God never called a man uh, out of settle? God called a man to preach what thus saith the Lord. Uh, and it's getting harder and harder to find uh, men of God with a backbone uh, that'll stand up and tell people the truth. Uh, we live in a society uh, where we it's come to pass what Paul said. Uh, uh, we've heaped to ourselves teachers having tickling ears. Uh, we want to hear things that make us feel good uh, instead of hearing what God said. Uh, uh, listen, neighbor, uh, I know no, I'm not much, uh, but one of these days when I stand before God, uh, I'll be glad to say uh, I did to the best of my ability uh, uh, to tell people the truth about God's Word. Uh, there's coming a day when God's going to say He's had enough. Can I say, there once was a time when there were people sitting in the pews 
that had a walk with God that they knew how to get a hold of God. They get in their prayer closets, uh, little grannies, uh, little grandpas, uh, get in them prayer closets, uh, and they'd pray the power of God on. Uh, I remember a time uh, when you just couldn't run to the doctor if you got sick. Uh, you had to go to the great physician uh, and depend on God. Uh, listen, I'm thankful for me a modern medicine. Uh, I'm thankful for doctors. Uh, I'm thankful for all the wisdom God's gave men. Uh, but never lose sight uh, who the great physician is. Uh, Hey, no matter what the doctor says, uh, if healing comes, it comes from him. Uh, hey, we was a better people uh, when we had to depend on him instead of on our HMO plans. Uh, hey, I remember a time uh, when people were hungry. Uh, they couldn't put groceries on a credit card. Uh, they had to pray them in. Uh, and I've seen times uh, where folks showed up with bags of groceries uh, uh, because God put it on their heart. Uh, somebody had a need uh, and they had no idea uh, them people been praying my babies won't eat God unless you do something uh, and can I say he's faithful and true uh, and he always comes through to his worst people uh, but we've got to a place we don't depend on God to eat anymore uh, we're so finicky we open our freezers and our cabinets and we turn up our nose at stuff that other countries would love to have uh, God's been good to us. And we've gotten so complacent. Hmm. I remember when folks would sing that, I see the rapture song or I see the lights at city song and folks would have been throwing babies and running laps and shouting and praising the victory because they know in whom they believed in. And yet, we've gotten and had it so good that we just come expecting God to show up it's a danger when you get to expecting God for anything we're to live by faith not by our expectations so can I say there comes a point when God when he's had enough notice some things when God's had enough can I say first of all when God's had enough his face is turned away look at verse number 10 he said, For I have set my face against this city for evil. Listen, when God turns his back on us, we're in trouble. That means all the blessings are cut off. That means Ichabod stamped over the door. That means there is no more touch or help from God. When he's had enough, he turns his back on it. Hmm? It's one thing for somebody to turn their back on you. It's one thing for an institution to turn their back on you. It's another thing when God turns his back on you. When God's had enough, his face is turned away. Can I say this? When God's had enough, his fury goes forth. Look again at verse 12. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning, deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like a fire. Hmm? Again, it's one thing to make somebody, you know, somebody mad at you. Lord, have mercy. I don't try to make people mad at me. Brother Ray, you know I've made people mad at me. I don't try. I just try to tell them the truth. But Bob, you all ain't been here very long, but there's sometimes I get under people's crawl. I don't even know what that means, but that's what the, what the folks used to say back home, huh? You've been in somebody's crawl, haven't you? I guess. I don't know. Huh? I don't try to make people mad. But if you live by this Bible and you live for the truth and you live to honor the Lord, you're going to make people mad not even trying to. Huh? But can I say, it's one thing to make somebody mad at you. It's a whole other thing when God's mad at you. Hmm? When God gets mad at you, friend, ooh, and he gets mad, his fury goes out when he's had enough. Hmm? Huh? And then I find this. When God's had enough, his fire consumes the forest. Look again in verse number 14. But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings. Uh, listen, he's not going to punish America for the fruit of Russia's doings, the fruit of China's doings, the fruit of Venezuela's doings. He's going to punish America for America's doings. Can I say he's going to punish his children not for somebody else's doings, but for their doings? Are you listening? But then he goes on and says, And I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, 
and it shall devour all things round about it. I'm interested in this forest. This is what piqued my interest in this whole chapter when I was reading. I'm interested in the forest. His fire consumes the forest. Now literally, there were people hiding out in the woods and in caves and in dens and in their heart they were saying, the enemy can't get to me because I'm out here. And God sends word through his man, uh, there's nobody safe. Uh, if you have not honored the Lord, you haven't been obedient to the Lord, uh, it don't matter where you're hiding, you can't run from God. Uh, you can't hide from God. Uh, you may think you're hiding out in a crowd, uh, but God's got more than a microscope on you. He knows right exactly where you are. And he says his fire is going to consume the forest. I was interested in that because not only does the book of Jeremiah have a literal context and not only does it have a prophetical context but it also has a spiritual context I'm interested what that force means not only prophetically but spiritually and so let me give you a few things about the forest what was in the forest that's what I'm interested in can I say, first of all, their city was in the forest. Can I say that prophetically speaking, whenever you find a prophet men mentioning the forest, he's referring to their city. He's referring to the forest. You know, forest has big trees. And he's referring to the wall around their city. He's referring to the buildings that have been up in their city, uh, built up in their city. Uh, and he's saying, uh, you may hide behind walls and you may hide in your sealed houses uh, and you may hide in your big cities, uh, but you're not safe because uh, God will burn down your forest. And can I say, God will burn down your city. Hmm? How many cities once thrived in America, but now they're war zones? I remember a day when a lot of people moved to Detroit, Michigan to go to work. And you could work in the auto industry and have a good living working in Detroit. Matter of fact, I've had relatives who used to drive up there and work all week and they'd drive back down to Somerset on the weekend to be with their family and go back up there and work all week, make that long journey. And that was before I-75 was built. But they made such a good living and everything was good in Detroit City. Until... They started trusting in kickbacks. They started trusting in how good God had been to them with their jobs, and they wanted more, and they wanted more, and they wanted more, and they wanted more, and finally all them jobs went to Mexico. Now, I haven't been to Detroit in a long time. I've been by it a few times when I go up to Chelsea, Michigan, to a camp meeting. But one thing I know about Detroit, it's a cesspool. Hmm. You don't want to drive down there at night, and you certainly don't want to walk around that city. Say, so what happened? They took the blessings of God for granted. Hmm? Huh? Happened in a little town called Norwood. Anybody ever hear of Norwood? No. Uh, boy, there was a time when that GM plant was cranking them out down there in Norwood, made Camaros. Anybody ever hear of a Camaro? Huh? Yeah, made some Monte Carlos. They was making cars there and, uh, uh, and parts for cars there in Norwood. Uh, and it was going great until they got greedy. Hmm? I was told that the attendance record at the plant, GM plant in Norwood, got so bad, Brother Ron, that they were offering a $100 bonus every week if you showed up all five days to work. They were making so much money, they was only working three and four days. They didn't need to work all five days. Hmm? And then uh, uh, they started to uh, want more demands every time a contract come up. They wanted more, and they wanted more, and they wanted more, and they got greedy. So what happened? Jobs went to Mexico. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't drive around Norwood much at night. Uh you better have bulletproof vests if you go out and walk around. Say, what happened? They got greedy. Can I say there's a lot of people in their personal cities got greedy. They thought the blessings of God would always come. They started taking for granted those blessings of God. They were no longer thankful for them. Uh, they no longer prayed and depended on God. Uh, and their cities have been burnt down by the hand of God. 
And not only was their city in their force, but their culture was in their force. There's a lot of folks don't realize what's going on in our culture in America. Can I say our culture in America doesn't come from God? Doesn't come from the Word of God? It's right out of the pits of hell. Amen. Everything going on in America is going on because we stop depending on God. Christians quit praying, quit seeking revival, and quit seeking God's face to move in our cities. We quit soul winning, quit telling folks about Jesus. And our cities become a mess. I used to, in America, you was innocent until proven guilty. But now in America, if popular opinion goes against what you stand on, you're guilty and you've got to prove your innocence. Used to, in America, the law of the land was what you were judged by, but now you're judged by what certain people say you ought to be judged by. Hmm? Now listen, I'm glad for America. But can I say, very few of us really have any right to America. We all came from somewhere else, unless you're a Native American, uh, like Miss Veronica. We all came from somewhere else. We all have ties somewhere else. huh? So America's always been a land of freedom. It's been a land with their arms wide open. There's always been an avenue to come to America. Used to, you had to come through Ellis Island. Used to, you'd have to register and come legally. And if you came legally and you did what the law said uh, and you uh, presented yourself as a good candidate for citizenship and you memorized the laws of this land uh, and you memorized the Constitution, what it stood for, uh, and you could pass the entrance exam, uh, you were received uh, uh, in America. That's why we have Irish people in America. That's why we have Germans in America. That's why we have people of Japanese descent and Chinese descent uh, and every nation on the face of the earth uh, has come here seeking a better life. And there's no problem when you do it legally. But now we live in a day and age where the law don't matter. Right. Hmm. And can I say, now America's become the cesspool. Where the wash pot of Moab, as the scriptures say, where the offscour of bad lands send their offscour to here. And we're putting up with it. Yeah. Amen. Mm. And now that Title 42 is gone, they're just busting them in, going to bust them to every city. Mm. Used to, I really used to hope and pray that God would send us a bilingual, uh, uh, Spanish-speaking, uh, uh, Mexican person, saved person, preacher to our church, so we could start a Mexican church in America. Because at one time, Outside of Hamilton, Ohio, in greater Cincinnati, Boone County, Kentucky, had the highest Mexican population. And I thought these people were going to go to church somewhere. Most of them are Catholic. They'll end up going to a Catholic church. Uh, I would to God that God would send us somebody that we could win these people to God. And then we have it. But can I say in Florence, we're getting other populations. There's a big Indian population. And I'm not talking about Native Americans. But there's a big Indian population here now. Nobody's winning them to God. Can I say in, in Florence and Boone County, there's a big African population. Amazon is changing our community. There are people coming from Africa to work at Amazon and they're getting great jobs at Amazon because Americans are too lazy to go get that job. Hmm? But I'm telling you, nobody's winning these Africans. Hmm? And you say, why are Africans and why are Middle Easterns and why are these people settling here in Florence? Is it because of Amazon, partly? But another reason is one that is far less advertised, Brother Bob where the Volkswagen dealership used to be right underneath the mall water tower. Several years ago, became a mosque. Now, can I say, uh, 
about 15 years ago they applied for a mosque in this city and about 10 years ago they applied again and uh, uh, can I say that uh, uh, city council turned them down said no you can't have a mosque here so they bought a dealership and turned one into themselves they made it a business instead of a religious thing but you go by and I can't read the writing on the sign and used to Miss Marcy I would see maybe three or four cars there I come by there not long ago and they were directing traffic they could not get everybody in there why because a lot of Muslims are coming here nobody's winning them why are these things happening why is our culture changing because we no longer require people to come to America to become Americans hmm America's always embraced people from everywhere but come legally now that no longer matters now here's the importance of that when God burns up our culture he burns up our living I don't know about you there's a little thing in the Constitution that says that we can't have taxation without representation but now they are taxing the middle class with executive orders and all kinds of things do you realize the middle class is paying for everything in America and the middle class is about ready to have its back broke do you realize how big a debt our nation's under and they're about ready to raise the debt ceiling again do you realize that everything going on uh, this rubber band is stretched as far as it can go and it's about ready to break I don't know about uh, do you, uh, does everybody love paying about 40 percent taxes that's what Naj left that's what they have in, in socialist countries in St. Lucia, the tax rate's 43%. We're headed there. Everybody like paying extra for gas? Do you realize uh, they can start to, uh, producing it and pumping it here and we can get it back down about $1.50 a gallon? But no! The powers of be don't want that. Well, how did they take over? We could quit depending on God. We took for granted how good we had it. Yeah. Amen. You see, can I say that... Uh, uh, well, the Spaniards uh, went to Mexico seeking gold. Our pilgrim forefathers came here seeking God. Uh, now it's flip. People come here seeking gold, and God says, you can have it. He's turned his back on it. You lose your living. Heaven help young couples like Seth and Bailey right here getting started out, because you're going to pay all your life into something called Social Security, and by the time you retire, there won't be a thing. Because I got news for you, it's bankrupt now. And see, Miss Marcy, in order to pay your pension out of Social Security, they're robbing his, and he ain't even started working yet. But that's where we are. And I saw a statistic the other day where a guy said that if he paid into Social Security over his lifetime, he would pay in almost a hundred and eighty something thousand dollars Social Security, but what they pay him in return is only about thirty-seven thousand dollars. So, boy, that's a great investment, isn't it? But can I say that uh, uh, for about the last 15 years, some Republicans wanted to privatize Social Security, let you uh, 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 invest your money where you want to invest it instead of uh, uh, the government doing it, and the Democrats have fought that and fought that and fought that. Why? They need your money to pay for all their welfare programs. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. See, our living is burned up. Can I say not only that, in our culture, our liberty is burned up. Used to, I thought we had a First Amendment in the Constitution where we had freedom of speech. Well, you do unless you say something against a person of color. Thank you, Phil. Used to, you had freedom of speech. If you said to something against any ethnic group, any religious group, anything, you were American. You was allowed to say what you thought. If you don't believe me, go watch Archie Bunker. Listen, that and I watched that a couple of Sundays ago. I'd said something about Archie Bunker, and we, we got home, we could pop some popcorn, and I said, hey, look, Archie Bunker's on. We watched it, we laughed. And then I'm thinking, how in the world did they get away with that? Because back then there was liberty. I'll give you another one. Dean Martin's Celebrity Roast. You watch that, you talk about off-color. Uh, you talk about some, some crazy stuff that they'd say. But you can't say those things in America anymore. The only one you're allowed to discriminate against in America is Christians. No problem. 
Or, or listen, again, I'm for all, everybody. But, but let's just be real honest. February is Black History Month. I just found this out. May is Asian American Month. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but I saw a commercial the other day. Uh, June is Gay Pride Month. Yeah. Whatever happened to your generation, son? Huh? Lord have mercy, huh? Can I say they got every kind of month for everything? But how come there's no celebrate Caucasian month? I'm not being ugly, but, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. How come we can celebrate everybody's heritage but Christian or white people? Uh, how come? I mean, that's a, that's a dirty word. Brother Doug, you're being racist. No, I'm for everybody. Well, let's, make it, let's make it fair. If we're going to make it fair, let's make it fair. Huh? Huh? Well, white people are mean. Let me ask you a question, Brother Clint. You've lived in this area your whole life, have you not? You grew up over here off Oots Lane. Then you moved over to, you know, Highland Heights, and you still come to church here. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Huh? How many slaves have you owned? <laughs> not a one, have you? Did you ever vote for slavery? Yeah. Was you ever for slavery? Yeah. Do you hate people of color? Okay, thank you. Can I say, I could ask everybody that same question. And we're not against people. But if you say something against somebody, uh, you know, because they have bad choices and they happen to be a person of color, then you're a racist. And they hate white people because we all own slaves. Lord have mercy. I don't know anybody rich enough to even own their own home, mostly. Right. Think about it. But they're wanting us to pay for people that never were slaves to get paid for being a slave. Amen. And they're doing that in San Francisco, by the way. Hmm? Huh? It's crazy. I'm just trying to say our liberties are gone because we took them for granted. Remember it used to in America you got to make choices? Like whether or not to put your seatbelt on? I'll let you in on a little secret. My son's a deputy sheriff, but... We don't wear our seatbelts very often. Uh, why? Because I'm getting this fat thing right here, and they bother me. Uh, but can I say, I remember when they started introducing the seatbelt laws, and they said seatbelts were optional, and they would never pull you over for not having a seatbelt on, but if they did pull you over and you didn't have one, they'd give you a warning. Then it changed to give you a citation. Now they can pull you over for not having a seatbelt on. Hmm. Well, we had liberties. We had choices. You know, if I want to die in a car crash for not having my seatbelt on, shouldn't that be my choice? But no, the government knows better. Hmm? How many of you remember when you didn't have to have a car seat for a baby? Now you got to have a car seat till they're 14. <laughs> what happened to our liberties? Well, the government knows better. Huh? And 49 million other legislative things they put in our life to take our liberties away. Wasn't America better when we depended on God to keep us safe instead of a seatbelt? Hey, Brother Doug, you're, you're, just, you're just being mean. I'm not being mean. I'm just wondering whatever happened. I'll tell you what happened. We quit trusting in God. And God's burning our culture. You don't believe it? Go to Seattle. Huh? Go to some of these places like Chicago where they say cops are bad, the law is bad, live however you want to, and then when people start doing and burn up their cities, then they're begging for the cops and they're begging for the law, but it's too late. Amen. Not only our living and our liberty, but also our leisure. I remember when it was a big deal to sit on the porch... Now we're so busy we don't have time to rest. Amen. You think that might be because we don't put God first? <laughs> what does God mean by burning up the forests, our cities, our culture? How about our children? 
We've sold our children out in this country. We've given them to an educational system that teaches them God does not exist. We've given them to an educational system that says we came from monkeys. I wouldn't, dis I wouldn't disrespect a monkey that way because, I mean, I've seen monkeys act better than some people in this world, huh? You know why people act the way they do? Sin. We didn't come from an ape. God made us after his own image. But we sell our children out to an institution and institutions. We send them away to college that teaches them uh, all kinds of uh, uh, communist, uh, communistic uh, uh, traits because those that are teaching are communist. Christians studied criminal justice and police studies at Eastern Kentucky University. Known throughout the country as one of the best criminal justice programs that there is. And he had a professor that taught them, all of them being police officers or something to do with criminal justice, taught them cops are bad. Hmm? Can I say a lot of teachers that really wanted to educate children, they're quitting in droves because of what school boards are telling them they have to teach instead of what's right. Hmm? So what happened? When God burns our force, it affects our children. Hmm? Huh? I remember when kids used to love coming to church. There's a lot of churches you, could, you don't find children at church. Hmm? Can I say this? I preached way too long tonight. Lord have mercy. When God talks about the force, He's talking about burning our choices that we've decided to do and we've ignored His commands. Hmm. Well, I'll just uh, do this instead of being what God tells me to be. I'll wear this. I'll go here. I'll do this. I'll not go to church. I'll not listen to the Bible. I'll not do what God says. I'll do my way. Do you know the philosophy of Satan is my right to my claim to myself? It's the essence of sin. Right. Selfishness is the essence of sin. And any time we choose to please or gratify ourselves more than God, when we've been bought by a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus, God will burn our force. The last thing that that force represents When God's had enough and He burns our forest, He burns our chance for reconciliation. See, we have preached and we have so minimized the blood of Jesus Christ. We give the ideology that you can live however you want to and whenever you just tell God you're sorry, God will forgive you. That's not what the Bible teaches. God teaches there's works meet for repentance. That if you repent and get right with God, you change from what you was to what, you want, what He wants you to be. And we've got given people the ideology, you can get right whenever you want to. No. No, you'll get right when God's dealing with you or you don't have to get right. But there comes a point when God turns people over to a reprobate mind and there is no hope for them. And even his own people, there comes a point when God says that's enough. You say, prove it. I'm glad you asked. Second Chronicles 36, 16 says this. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. There comes a point when God says that's it. My brother Doug, why this message? Why we have hope. Why we have opportunity. Why we have this moment in time. We ought to embrace everything God has for us. We ought to never take for granted His grace. We ought to seek His face. We ought to hunger and thirst for His righteousness. Listen, I love I'll see in the rapture. I love I can almost see the lights of the city. And we need to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But my dear friends, some of us has had our heads so high in the sky that we forgot to look around and see what this world's going on. And we're not being what we should be for Christ. Listen, 
He told us to work while it's day, for the night time cometh when no man can work. Yeah, hallelujah. I'm looking forward to the rapture. But what we're to be doing is trying to get everybody we can under the umbrella of grace so they can be ready for it too. Huh? I'm looking for the lights of that city. I find great comfort in John 21 when John saw a city coming down. I find great hope in those things. But while we're here, we're to appreciate the good grace of God. We're to embrace it. We're to do everything we can to please God. I don't want him to burn my forest. I don't want him to turn his back on me. I don't want his fury to go out in my life. I don't want to displease the Lord. You say, how can we displease the Lord? Just never seeking to please him. God help us to seek to please the Lord with our life. Let me ask you a question. Are you living for God? Are you trusting God? Do you know God? Are you putting Him first in your life? You say, Brother Doug, you don't know the circumstances in my life. The grace of God is not dependent on our circumstances. The grace of God is dependent on the unmerited favor of God. And God can change our circumstances when we trust Him. Hmm? Brother Doug, you just don't know what I'm going through. No, nope, but God does. And God can help you. But He won't help you until you're willing to give Him your all. I wonder tonight, if the Lord came back tonight, if tonight was the rapture, hallelujah, it would be a blessing if it was. If tonight was the rapture, would you be glad to see Him? Or would you be ashamed to see Him? Because one night he is coming. One day he is coming. See, we all know that. We just don't think it's today. But it might be today. Hmm? I wonder. You ready to meet him? You know, I kind of pray he does come soon. Before little Elizabeth and little Ella reach the age of accountability, I know they're going. Uh, what can I say? If today was the day, are you ready? Say, well, I went to church today. Wonderful. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Is everything clean between you and the Lord? Are you everything you can be for the Lord? Because He's coming. Could come today. You ready? Hmm? So I hope so. That's not good enough. I'm hoping Dairy Queen's still open and me and Miss Neck get to go eat there tonight. Get us a little blizzard action going on. Huh? But that might not be the case. Because afterwards I might get fellowship with somebody and Dairy Queen may close. Hope's not good enough. Especially when you're dealing with your soul. Hmm? Do you know that you're ready to meet him? And if so, when you do meet him, will you be ashamed? I'm trying to quit, but the Lord won't let me. Brother Clint, I'm nobody. I'm just God's servant. But there are people who can't look me in the eye. They can't look me in the lie in the eye who's made of the same stuff they are. What are they going to do when they got to look into those eyes as flames of fire? Friend, I'm saying all that saying you can be ready. God still is extending grace and mercy, and his love still calling folks to get their house in order and get their lives right with the Lord. All I know is tonight might be the night that he comes. But Sid, tonight might be the night that's the last time he's going to speak to us. There comes a day in the life of Israel when God stops speaking to them and Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes over. Tonight might be the last time God speaks to you or to me or to our church. We better embrace and do what thus saith the Lord while we have opportunity. Tonight might be the night. Are you ready? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Miss Tina, come play. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, we'd love to introduce you to the Savior. One thing I know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. Thank God God's a loving God and a forgiving God. But there comes a point when God's had enough.
Has he had enough in your life? Are they picking out a song? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, a sober message for a sober moment in time. Lord, you've been good to our church. Lord, we've been blessed to see folks saved, see families get help. But Lord, there's many out there not ready to meet you. It's not time for us to rest from our labor. That day's coming. It's our time to be busy about the Father's business. And Lord, it's hard to be busy about your business when we're not where we should be with you. So God, help us to realize there comes a point when you've had enough. God, speak to hearts now. God, just extend mercy and grace. God, may the Holy Spirit not be grieved or quenched. And God, may you do a work here tonight in our hearts. Help us to be ready for that glorious time of the rapture. Help us to be excited when we get to see you as you are. Help us to be right with you. Help us, Lord, to be all we can be in Christ. Now, Lord, bless. God, certainly, if there's somebody here not saved, I pray you'd convict them and save them. There's somebody saved but not where they should be. God, I pray you'd work in their hearts, and God, we'd see them where they should be. God, I pray for the choicest saint of God that's uh, living as close to you as anybody can. I pray you'd continue to bless them and help them to live that way because they're written epistles known and read of all men, and they're an encouragement and blessing to others. Now, Father, thank you for these already in the altar. Speak to hearts. Lord, I know I preach way too long, but Lord, you, you wouldn't let me quit. There had to be points that had to you be getting got across. So God, speak to hearts. Have your way. Use my inadequacy. And God, get glory to your name. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.